If the S&P is to return to um, where it should be, given that negative correlation, then I can see the S&P under a thousand. Now, this is a hell of a problem for banks because guess what? They have an awful lot of this stuff, you know, equity as collateral. Um, and the problem is who's gonna buy this stuff, uh, you know, when they have to call it in. So they're in the situation where they can see that this is about to, you know, this is this is wildly overvalued. It's another reason they don't want to do any lending. It's another reason why they're trying to get out of commercial loans into, say, short-term treasuries, you know, T-bills and things like that. McLeod begins by discussing the critical function of the Federal Reserve and the S-Treasury in safeguarding the commercial banking system. He argues that these institutions are unlikely to pursue bail-ins as protecting depositors is paramount. The FDIC's limited capacity to cover losses means that even wealthy depositors cannot be disregarded. Deposits are inherently tied to loans, making them a crucial element of the banking system's stability. The Fed's intervention in the market, especially in acquiring bonds at face value, is a measure to prevent a collapse akin to the Silicon Valley bank crisis. This move helps banks manage their balance sheets and avoid the devastating effects of marking bonds to market value. McLeod delves into the intricacies of the bond market and how rising interest rates impact banks holding long-term debt. He explains that banks initially purchased long-term bonds for yield pickup, funding them at near zero rates. However, the sharp increase in interest rates has led to significant losses in both the capital value of these bonds and the profitability of holding them. This scenario puts immense pressure on banks, especially those with high operational leverage, as they struggle to manage their assets and liabilities. McLeod predicts further support from fiscal and monetary authorities to mitigate these issues. The video highlights the mounting problems in commercial real estate and private equity. McLeod notes that many banks are heavily exposed to these sectors, which have been adversely affected by rising interest rates. The private equity industry, in particular, faces significant challenges as leveraged investments become uneconomical. As these industries grapple with higher financing costs, banks are increasingly wary of extending credit McLeod suggests that banks may shift their focus towards safer investments like short-term treasuries, mirroring the actions of money market funds. McLeod explores the negative correlation between its treasury yields and the S&P 500. He observes that, historically, rising yields have led to declines in equity prices. However, the current market environment has seen an unusual divergence, with the S&P 500 remaining relatively stable despite significant increases in interest rates. McLeod warns that if this negative correlation reasserts itself, the S&P 500 could experience a dramatic decline, potentially falling below 1,000 points. Such a drop would severely impact banks holding equities as collateral, further complicating their financial positions. Now we'll show you the best clips of the latest interview. But first hit the like button, smash the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you do not miss out our daily recaps. I think the first thing, I mean, your point about Dodd-Frank and bailing in and all the rest of it, I think is well made. Um, you have to bear in mind that um, probably the most important function of the Fed and the US Treasury is to ensure the integrity of the commercial banking system. They will not go down the bail-in route. They will, they, they have to protect depositors because um, the FDIC is not large enough, actually, to act as a backstop. And in any event, um, you know, this idea that you know, rich depositors, well, who cares about them? I mean, that's, that's, that's nonsense, because that's not how deposits originate. Deposits originate with loans. And, um, uh, you know, the deposits, if you like, are the symptom of the loans on the other side of the balance sheet. Um, and um, really, um, you know, it's, it, it, it means there has to be a rescue. Uh, you know, we don't know um, how much the rescue is. We, we can't quantify it. All we do know is that the whole system is in uh, crisis, which is being sat on. I mean, this is the whole uh, concept. Um, but this is why the Fed has gone uh, uh, um, uh, into the market, and, well, into, into, into the banking system and said, look, if you've got bonds which you want, um, you know, which which are underwater, and your auditors are saying you've got to value these at mark to market. We will take those on our own balance sheet and lend you one hundred um, 
cents on the dollar or one hundred dollars, you know, we will lend lend you the face value of those bonds, so that um, you know, okay, um, you know, you can say to your auditors, you 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 value these at par, and you know, also of course, the Fed is valuing it, <laughs> valuing their um, holdings at par, um, so. The reason they've had to do this is basically to stop um, the sort of, um, you know, uh, Silicon Valley bank crisis where banks bought um, long term debt, um, funding it, um, you know, at sort of, uh, you know, the Fed close to the Fed funds rate of at the time of sort of just over zero, um, getting a yield pickup of, say, three quarters of a percent on a 10 year U.S. Treasury. Um, and then finding that their PL account has got destroyed by the rise in interest rates because they're having to fund it at now at 5%, 5.3%, whatever. Um, and at the same time, the capital value of the bond has collapsed. You know, this is, um, and it just completely destroys any bank with any degree of operational leverage. Uh, and that's what's happened. Um, I would expect, um, you know, more. Um, or an extension of that, and also more help from the authorities. Now, whether it's it's the fiscal authorities, whether it's the monetary authorities, I mean, they will sort it out between them to try and stop the rot. Um, so what actually is that rot? Well, you know that we do know that um, banks have got real trouble um, in terms of uh, bonds with, with long maturities or certainly longer than short term maturities, more than one year, uh, on which they've got capital losses. Um, we also know that these banks are facing um, problems from uh, their, you know, their, their, their loans. I mean, look at uh, commercial real estate, for example. Um, I would say also the private equity industry is also getting into great difficulties because they've basically leveraged up um, equity investment on the back of low interest rates. And as those low interest rates have to be rolled, um, they're facing, you know, it's, it's just made the whole thing completely uneconomic. Um, we've got that problem in, in this country. Um, and uh, I don't know to what extent it's a problem in America, but I can imagine that the problem is there as well because the private equity industry is a very, very big industry. Um, so you've got that. And on top of that, if you look at um, the current level of um, US Treasury yields going out along the yield curve and uh, try and get some sort of idea as to what the effect on the equity market should be of this rise in interest rates, then, um, I mean, I put a chart together of, of the 10 year yield and uh, the S&P. And I can tell you that if you invert the yield um, so that or no, invert the S&P so that you've got anyway, you've got them both going in the same direction, even though they're completely negatively co correlated. You can see the, co the, you know, the negative correlation is very, very tight or it was until we came to um, COVID. Uh, when um, interest rates were cut to the zero bound, um, the S&P didn't really respond that much. But now that it's shot up to, you know, the yield shot up to 5%, currently about 4.6, um, the S&P didn't act, hasn't actually reacted very much either. If the S&P is to return to um, where it should be, given that negative correlation, then I can see the S&P under 1,000. Now, this is a hell of a problem for banks because guess what? They have an awful lot of this stuff, you know, equity as collateral. Um, and the problem is who's going to buy this stuff, uh, you know, when they have to call it in. So they're in the situation where they can see that this is about to, you know, this is this is wildly overvalued. It's another reason they don't want to do any lending. It's another reason why they're trying to get out of commercial loans into, say, short term treasuries, you know, T-bills and things like that. The discussion shifts to the broader economic implications of current financial trends. McLeod argues that the shift from private sector investment to government securities, driven by rising interest rates, starves the economy of credit. This trend could lead to a collapse in collateral values, creating significant challenges for banks. He compares the current situation to the Great Depression, where a wave of bank failures led to a massive contraction in bank credit. However, he notes that today's banking system has mechanisms like the FDIC to prevent a similar scale of collapse. 
albeit with the potential cost of central bank-induced inflation. McLeod distinguishes between commercial bank credit and central bank credit, noting that the latter is inherently inflationary. He explains that commercial bank credit generally aligns with economic demand and is not inherently inflationary. In contrast, central bank credit, especially when detached from a gold standard, leads to a devaluation of the currency. He cites the collapse in the purchasing power of the dollar since the abandonment of the gold standard in 1971 as a prime example. McLeod warns that whether a crisis is averted or not, the inevitable result will be a significant expansion of central bank credit, further fueling inflation. Which is also what the money funds have been doing. I mean, you, you know, people have been uh, sort of quizzing me about, uh, you know, why is the reverse repo facility collapsed? I mean, it's gone down for what, two, two and a bit trillion, 2.3 something, down to about 1.2 trillion. Well, I mean, the answer basically is that um, uh, the the money funds, um, you know, have, have gone for treasuries, you know, the T-bills, um, where, you know, the yield is as good and probably slightly better than you can get on the reverse repo. Um, all this is driving money out of the private sector into um, into government, into the, into the federal government, um, making the economy starved, if you like, of credit. Um, and uh, you can see that, uh, you know, these are conditions which um, are going to lead towards a collapse in the value of collaterals, of collateral. Uh, and the banks are going to have a real problem um, trying to square their books. You know, I, I can just see this sort of getting really rather out of control. Now, as to the point about, um, you know, it's the Fed's job to ensure the integrity of the banking system. That has gone long gone, but they still have the responsibility for ensuring that the thing doesn't collapse. I mean, you cannot, we just cannot have the situation we had in the 1930s where, you know, in sort of between 1929 and 1933, something like 9,000 banks collapsed, you know, and that contracted um, uh, bank credit by over 30%. You know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't banks actually calling in loans, it was actually banks going bust, you know, and when a bank goes bust, that was it. We didn't have the FDIC in those days or anything like that. So um, this is a situation which uh, I think the authorities will be desperate to avoid. The cost of it, of course, is, um, uh, if you like, the inflation of, of credit at the central bank level, replacing the contraction of credit at the commercial bank level. The difference between the two is, is vital to understand. Commercial bank credit, you know, with some exceptions, which produces actually a bit of a cycle, but we'll just ignore that for a moment. Commercial bank credit um, is basically driven by commercial demand. In other words, you know, I have a business idea. I want to go and make something. I come up with a business plan um, and uh, uh, I persuade the bank to lend me the money in order to do it or alternatively i look at my own resources in this and think i've got to get this return on it whatever whatever so whatever credit comes out of the commercial banking system under those circumstances and there are exceptions i'll just mention those in a moment basically goes along with economic demand and is not inflationary where it becomes inflationary is where um, the banks lend money to you and me um, to go and buy things which you know with money we haven't earned on the prospect that we might earn it at some stage in the future. That is non-productive credit. The other thing, and the other example is that when uh, the economy is looking pretty good and banks are, you know, sort of think, well, we've got to, you know, we're not making enough money out of this. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, aim, aim for these industries because they're strategically important. So we will cut our lending margins to these industries because we want to attract them as customers. We want that business, but we will compensate for the loss of income on the contraction of credit by increasing our operational leverage. Now that is also inflationary, and that's what you know that that gives you the the bank credit cycle. Um, compare that, but I mean, apart from those two things, basically um, the expansion of bank credit goes pretty much in line with commercial demand, and is not inflationary. Now consider the situation with central bank credit. It is always inflationary. And if you want um, 
an example of, you know, sort of see the difference between the two. I mean, we didn't have any inflation at all until 1971, worth mentioning anyway. But as soon as as soon as soon um, uh, central bank credit untied itself from $35 to, to the ounce, um, what happened? I mean, the purchasing power of the dollar started collapsing. And that is entirely due to um, the change, if you like, in what happened to central bank credit, having been detached from gold, detaching its value from gold, standing on its own, it just takes the value of everything down. Um, and and what we are going to see inevitably is that whether the crisis actually occurs or whether it is avoided, whatever, you're going to see a massive expansion.